Good snowy morning, Knox. I hope you're staying inside and keeping warm. Or if you're like me, you're making sure to build time into your day to go out and frolic in the snow. I'm recording these announcements on Friday morning, so it is a snow day. My children are already outside and I am anxiously awaiting the opportunity to go and join them. Yes, and I suppose to shovel the sidewalk too. Uh, I did want to record some up-to-date announcements for you, especially given the fact that last week I let you know that I would uh, give you an update on the session's decision about reopening the sanctuary. So it pleases me to inform you that the session of Knox Oakville has approved the reopening of in-person worship for Sunday, March 13th. That gives our team a, a bit of runway to get back into the building on a Sunday morning to get our tech back up to snuff and doing what we need it to do in time to prep for our hybrid worship. So hybrid, a reminder to you that hybrid worship means that the experience you have in the sanctuary and the experience of worship you have at home are as similar as possible. That takes a lot of heavy lifting from our team up in the balcony. So thanks again to all of our tech folk uh, and the work that they're gonna be doing over the next few weeks to get that transition in place. Of course, there'll be more details about that return uh, forthcoming. You can watch in the newsletter uh, that'll go out next weekend and uh, the website, and you can always call the office. Uh, the building is open again. The office hours uh, have returned to normal. And so, yeah, reach out and get more details. Uh, this is very fresh news for us too. Speaking of news, the session also endorsed the Chancel Guild's decision to host an in-person pancake dinner this year. I think it's worth noting that Shrove Tuesday, the pancake dinner, was one of the last social events that we had at Knox before we were shut down by uh, the coronavirus pandemic in March of 2020. And so I think it's totally appropriate that that is how we move towards reopening a bit too. Uh, only attend and only participate as you feel safe and comfortable to do so. Uh, again, more details will be forthcoming, but I want to let you know, so you can put it on your calendar, that Tuesday, March 1st, uh, 2022, we'll be having a pancake dinner down in the CK Nickel Hall. There will be two sittings, one at 5 and one at 7.30. So pay attention for details about that, how you can register for that event, the cost, and so on. Uh, today's worship service is uh, taken from 2018, and I chose it for a few reasons. First off, uh, it is the next, the, the passage that I had preached that Sunday is the next one in our narrative lectionary. So we're going to look at John 9, which is what I would have been preaching on today anyway. Uh, but also our worship and ministry and tech team, we just needed to catch our breath for a minute. Um, we had the rug pulled out from underneath us just before Christmas with Omicron. Uh, and in order to get really going uh, in time for Lent, which starts at the beginning of March, we just needed a week to catch our breath. And so I selected this service in part so that it's in keeping with the series that we've been working on together for the last few months uh, through worship services, but also just to give uh, the folk at Knox and the leadership just a minute, just a minute to catch their breath. And, and we so appreciate your cards and your words of encouragement and your messages and your cookies when you leave them for us. Uh, thank you so much for loving your ministry team at Knox. It makes a huge difference. And so do enjoy worship God well today. Continue to make your gifts and your offerings and your tithes and put those special dates on your calendar. Return to in-person Sunday, March 13th. But before that, get your pancakes on, on March the 1st. That's it. Now let's worship God.
Please join me in our responsive call to worship about recognizing Jesus. When God appeared on earth in the person of Jesus, most of the world didn't recognize him and therefore did not worship him. Today, we ask for faith that will open our eyes to see Jesus for who he is, that we might worship him in spirit and in truth. People of God, behold your God. Indeed, he is Lord, and so let's sing to him, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus in the morning, because it is the morning time. Praise number 378.
take a moment and quiet our hearts and minds and allow the Holy Spirit to wash over us as we approach the triune God of grace. Praise be to you, creator God. Out of darkness, you bring light. Out of strife, you bring peace. Out of oppression, you bring freedom. And praise be to you, Jesus Christ. Out of illness, you coax healing. Out of brokenness, you bring unity. Out of falsehood, you bring truth. And praise be to you, Holy Spirit. Out of chaos, you bring order. Out of confusion, you bring insight. Out of death, you bring life. In all things, in all circumstances, in all situations, you are working to bring about good. Triune God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that which keeps us from living fully in your presence, from receiving your healing. Forgive us for those times when we've been distracted by greed and pride. Forgive us for dwelling too deeply on our own disappointments. Forgive us for clinging to anger. Forgive us for not listening to your voice. Transfigure us, Lord, so that your glory may be seen in us. Transfigure us so that we conform more and more to the image of your son, Jesus whose name we pray this morning. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do not be afraid. God's forgiveness shines in the world and scatters the darkness. The morning star rises even within our hearts, and we are made brand new. Know that you are forgiven, and forgive each other. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue uh, lifting our voice in praise. This one is not uh, in our February theme, but it's a beautiful hymn nonetheless, number 508. We have a whole section in our hymnal called The Bible, uh, and it's hymns uh, for illumination that we sing together, asking the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds uh, before the reading of God's word. And so we're going to re- uh, sing Praise 508, but only verses 1 and 4. Your word, O God, awoke the uncreated.
please be seated. This morning's scripture reading is long. It's a whole chapter. Uh, so you're welcome to follow along in the Pew Bible, the NRSV version. But I'd like to invite up Louis and Andres, and there'll be some other voices coming from the congregation to help us read. You'll notice that we did this in Genesis as well, a lot of uh, dramatized readings, because these are stories. Uh, to be told and, and shared in um, creative ways. And so we're trying to break it up a little bit. So feel free to just put the Bible down and listen. I haven't mucked around with it too much. You can, you can trust what you're about to hear. And so John chapter 9. As he, that is Jesus, as he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind, so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Then the man went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Is, is it he? It is he. No, it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. Well, they brought the Pharisees, the man who, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And then they asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Well, the man's parents answered, We know that he is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Now, his parents had said this, frankly, because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Well, they didn't like that. And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, as for this Jesus, we don't, do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. 
Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sin. Are you honestly trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Now Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus replied, You have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, hissed and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well read. Thanks, everyone. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. I know you already noticed that. You noticed the white on the pulpit and the lectern and you thought something is different about this day. We're not in green anymore. I know you noticed. Let me explain why that's significant. There's a story in the Synoptic Gospels that tells of Jesus taking three of his disciples up a mountain to pray. While they're there, Jesus begins to shine with bright rays of light. Then Moses and the prophet Elijah appear next to him, and the three of them have a little chat. At some point in the event, God's voice breaks through the scene, calling Jesus son something reminiscent of his baptism event. There are a few details, of course, that vary between the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but that's basically the gist of it. It goes without saying that the transfiguration of Christ is a pivotal moment in the story arc. And the setting of it on the mountain is symbolic of the point where human nature meets God's nature, the meeting place of the temporal and the eternal, with Jesus himself as that connecting point, the bridge between heaven and earth. This story is crucial to the Christian tradition. For many Christians in the global church, transfiguration is actually a major feast day. Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Anglican Christians, for starters, mark the event in a grand way. And though we don't get quite... As excited about Transfiguration Sunday in the Protestant branch of the global Christian church, and by that I mean we haven't quite made it a day to serve cake at coffee hour, uh, it is still a day marked all over mainline churches in the world. For us, Transfiguration is important. It's important as the gateway to the season of Lent. Lent and eventually Easter. In the same way, actually, that Christ the King Sunday is the gateway to the season of Advent. Advent and then eventually Christmas. Chronologically, we just seem to like to be reminded of exalted, cosmic, shiny Jesus right before entering a long season of prayer and penitence, anticipation and hope. What's interesting in all of this, and you're wondering if I've got the wrong notes for the wrong scripture reading this morning, What's interesting in all of this is that the transfiguration story didn't factor into John's gospel at all. There's no account in our gospel of choice uh, this year reflecting a dazzling, shining Jesus on a hill flanked by force ghosts of Elijah and Moses. So what do we make of that? Well, one theory is that as the final gospel to be penned, John figured the topic of transfiguration had been sufficiently covered by the other gospel writers, and it didn't bear repeating in his own. In fact, that's a current theory for why John's gospel seems all, so altogether different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
He simply assumed that his audience would have already read those Gospels, as well as Q and some other writings of the time. So John filled his Gospel with different tales, a supplementary of Jesus' life and ministry. And for whatever reason, he didn't include a story about Jesus traveling up a mountain and being dazzlingly transfigured. There's no shine, Jesus, shine. So what does that mean for us? It means that while our brothers and sisters in Christian churches around the world today mark the celebration of Jesus' transfiguration, as recorded by Matthew, Mark, or Luke, we and those following the narrative lectionary are left with a bit of a head-scratcher. John's tale of Jesus healing the man born blind. Substantially less dramatic, markedly less dazzling, not a feast day, Nobody even brought cake. Nevertheless, as I prayed over this passage, as I crawled inside of it, I found myself asking this question over and over and over again. Is Jesus the only one who experiences transfiguration? What of the transfigured believer? That is, what does it look like to be transfigured by an encounter with the living Lord of life and light, to be named and claimed by God, by the God of creation, to be called son or daughter. Taking the blind man as an example, I wonder if something far more substantial than ocular regeneration took place that day. I wonder if we could call the outcome of his encounter with Christ a transfiguration of sorts. Now, here's the problem. We live in a world in which you almost get the impression that there's a standard template for life of faith in Christ. We ask things of each other like, so when did you become a believer? Uh, Did you say the special prayer? Uh, Did you have a conversion experience? Have you been a follower your whole life? Or perhaps you've been a churchgoer your whole life, but you're still not sure about this Jesus fellow. The truth of the matter, or at least the truth as presented by John and his gospel, is there is not a one-size-fits-all experience of faith. By way of example, let me ask you a question. At what point in this story did the man who was born blind, at what point did he become a believer? At what point? Was it when Jesus touched his eyes with mud and saliva? Was it when Jesus spoke to him, giving him instructions to go and wash? Did he become a believer when he responded to Jesus' directive? Was it when his sight was restored and he could see for the first time? Was it when he told the curious villagers or the irate Pharisees how it was that he came to see? Or was it only at the very end when he finally confessed, Lord, I believe, and worshiped him? At what point did he become a believer? The truth is his transformation, his transfiguration to discipleship had been a gradual progression. We gather that he was born blind, or at least the NRSV translators felt compelled to add that line into the story. It's not in the original Greek. And that day, he was simply there, sitting, listening to passers-by, hearing them stop and stare at him, hoping maybe they'll toss him a coin, wondering out loud about his condition. I actually wonder if he often whispered under his breath, I am blind, not deaf, you know. This particular conversation this one day was one he probably had heard a million times before. Who was to blame for his condition? Was his blindness genetically induced? Was it a punishment from God? Was there something in the water that her mother drank during pregnant, or his mother drank during pregnancy? Was the whole thing maybe psychosomatic? On and on. He'd heard the debates his whole life. The prevailing narrative being that someone must have done something wrong for him to be experiencing such suffering. Sadly, this pervasive, 
and dangerously narrow theology of God's justice is alive and well today, sadly. But what caught the man's attention this day was the voice in the group who seemed uninterested in the question his peers presented him. Who sinned, Jesus, this man or his parents? Jesus doesn't even answer that question, doesn't even give it any thought. Instead, he responds simply about having to work with the conditions we've got. In verse 4 and 5, Jesus says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Then Jesus does something I wouldn't recommend repeating, especially not in the height of cold and flu season. He spits on the ground, mixes his saliva with the dirt, and rubs it in the man's eyes. So gross. I'll admit that I am not a fan of Jesus' methods here. Though, though, hmm, given how John opens his gospel and its parallels to Genesis 1, this is just a fun little tangent for you. I can't help but wonder if this whole business of dirt, of the earth, and the spittle of God isn't John tipping his hat to Jesus bringing about a new creation, that in Christ human beings are made new. Remember how John's gospel opens. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made. In his hands we are shown to be what we truly are meant to be. So we have to wonder, is this when the man becomes a believer then? When Jesus touches his eyes with the dirt of the earth? Now technically... He hasn't gained his sight at this exact moment. Sort of like Schrodinger's cat, actually. Could he see? We don't know. The mud was there. After all, his eyes are caked, so he can't see. He doesn't know if he can see. He doesn't even know who has done this to him and if it's some kind of prank. But Jesus then tells him to go and wash up in the pool of Siloam. Without a second thought, me too, if someone spit in the dirt and rubbed it on my face... Uh, Without a second thought, the man with mud-caked eyes fumbles towards the pool, a large reservoir of fresh water attached to the south end of the temple, and he starts splashing the water in his face to get the mud off his eyes. Wait, does his responsiveness to Jesus' directive qualify him as a believer? Was this an act of faith or just hygiene? But he returns from the pool, able to see for the first time in his life, to see light and dark, color and shade, lines and dimensions. I wonder if the onslaught of it all actually made him dizzy, perhaps even ill. It would have been a lot to take in all of a sudden and all at once. Now people around him are gobsmacked. Is this really him? Is this the man, the beggar, blind for as long as they've known him? They can scarcely recognize him. He's standing tall and straight, shoulders back, confident. His features look the same, but his countenance has changed completely. You could almost say he was glowing. Even the muscles in his face were different now. As he looked around voraciously, taking in everything he laid his eyes on. He could see now what people actually looked like. He could see sky and cloud, dirt and trees, animals and birds, things he had only known by touch and sound now had an entirely different dimension. Was this when he became a believer? When his eyes were opened to a whole new plane of existence? Did he become a believer when he spoke of his regenerated sight to the people of his village? And to the Pharisees who interrogated him over and over and over the original Spanish Inquisition. He didn't have any answers. He hadn't yet had an opportunity to put together a theory of of how it all worked. It seemed to have happened so fast. No incantations or decoctions. Just some spit in the mud and a wash in the pool. Had it always been that easy? Could he have done that? before? 
His lack of explanation was infuriating to the religious leaders, who very quickly began to suspect heresy, even apostasy. Yet all the man could do was repeat the refrain and testify, I once was blind, but now I see. Well, the whole thing caused quite a stir, and very quickly, word got back to Jesus. He came alongside the man, but of course the man didn't recognize Jesus' face. He had never actually seen Jesus before. Think about that for a moment. Face to face with the Son of God, the one who had just completely changed his life and yet entirely unrecognizable, a new face to him. And Jesus asks him a question, Sir, do you believe in the Messiah? the son of man. It seemed an odd question, given everyone else he encountered wanted to know about his eyes and by what means he had come to acquire sight. In comparison, Jesus' question seems completely out of left field. Do you believe in the Messiah? The Messiah? What? Where? Tell me who he is, where he is, and I will believe in him. And Jesus replies, you're looking at him. So is this then when the man became a believer? It must be since right after that he crashes to his knees in confession, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped Jesus. Through tears of shock and gratitude and pure euphoria, he probably didn't even hear Jesus going on and on about being light to the world, about the one casting light on true blindedness and true sight. I wonder if he even heard the Pharisees hissing. So, friends, when did the man become a disciple of Christ? My working theory here, if it hasn't become obvious, is that it was a long pro uh, process of blindness and sight, of not knowing and then recognizing, of grasping and then understanding, of confessing and worshiping. I actually believe that the man was not simply healed that day, he was transfigured, little by little, step by step. Transfiguration is no mere transition. No, transfiguration is transfiguration. You are changed. It's internal, it's external, it's confusing and transformative and life-changing and disruptive. Simply put, there is no way you can be the same after an event like this. Yet even the event itself involved a gradual encounter with Jesus. And that's the point, I think. When did you become a believer? You might be able to point to a moment in time, a prayer, an experience. And yet, like the blind man, I'm willing to bet that Jesus has actually been working in your life, in the background, mixing mud with saliva, sending you to pools of cleansing, long before you ever even recognized his face. It could be that you aren't yet sure if you even are a disciple of Christ. It could be that you aren't sure yet if you even have seen his face. To you, I say, be at peace. Be at peace because God already knows you. God has already chosen you. God has already called you son, has already called you daughter process is actually already happening. Your transfiguration is underway. Perhaps you simply need to open your eyes and see it, or name it, or let it wash over you. Do you believe in the Messiah, the Son of Man? Where is he? You're looking at him, Jesus said. Yet, here's the scary truth about transfiguration. Transfiguration, you'll recall, stands as the doorway to Lent, to that long road towards Calvary's cross, towards death. 
You see, once God says, this is my daughter, this is my son, this is no mere baptismal affirmation anymore, or at least one where you can rest on your blessings and laurels. Listen, listen, true transfiguration changes and propels you into a life, into a way of being that manifests the kingdom of God for all to see. And that's dangerous because it disrupts the world. And when the kingdom of God is visible, when it is palpable, you can be sure that forces perceiving it as a threat, as that which might usurp power will be poised and will be ready to figure out how to extinguish its light and shut it down. Transfiguration is dangerous. Inevitably, transfiguration leads to the cross. Transfiguration, whether of Jesus in the synoptic gospels or of believers like you and I, according to John's gospel, is no mere demonstration. It's not a party trick of God's glory, but is that which insists that God's glory will persist in the midst of and in spite of all that would point to the contrary. Transfiguration points to the potential of our future, of God's future, life over death, light over darkness, sight over blindness. But first it goes to the cross. It dies to self. It dies to the ways of the world. If the transfiguration is to mean anything for our lives, it simply has to be that which intrudes on our present, changes our present, and contends that we imagine our future in a different kind of way, a Lenten way, a crucifixion way, yet ultimately a resurrection way. Any encounter with Jesus reveals our future and claims our future. We cannot stay the same after that. A transfigured God in Christ claims us, claims each of us as transfigured believers. But he starts doing it often before we even realize it's happening. Encountering Jesus is a process. When did I become a believer? I don't even know if I could say for sure anymore. I know I was baptized as a baby. I know I was confirmed in the church as an adolescent. I know that I chose Jesus very intentionally after a dangerous foray into the darkness. Maybe I'm still choosing Jesus. When did I become a believer? I can't say for sure because it's been in his hands all along. The life of faith has been a gift to me and it's a gift to you and a gift to this world, God's gift all along. And perhaps that seems like a weak explanation, but like the blind man, it's our only testimony. I once was blind, but now, now I see. Somehow over time, we've been invited to be transfigured. But know that when you rub that mud from your eyes, it's the cross that comes into view over the horizon. The world's desperate attempt to snuff out the light of Christ burning in you. But hang in there, sons and daughters of God. Why? Because the empty tomb waits on the other side. Hallelujah. To God be all the glory. Amen. What else could we possibly sing as a hymn of response than number 670, Amazing Grace?
And I think the best thing right now is just a moment of, of quiet. Generous God, you created this beautiful world, a world that reveals your majesty at every turn. You sent your son to make known your love, your grace, amazing grace, and to show us the way of compassion. You gave us the gift of your spirit to comfort and to guide us to transform and transfigure us as sons and daughters. You continue to bless us with people, friends, and family who reveal your presence in laughter, in tears, in forgiveness and friendship, and in unconditional love. We thank you for your faithful presence in all these ways with us each and every day. Help us to look for you not only in mountaintop experiences, but also in the day to day, recognizing that we are works in progress and you're not done with us yet. Righteous God, ours is a world desperately in need of transformation and redemption. We thank you for ways you work in and through us to accomplish this. Where there's violence, may we bring your peace. Where there's poverty, may we provide sustenance. Where minds and hearts are troubled, may we be bearers of your comfort. Where there is pain, may we be brave enough to bring what relief we can. Gracious and loving God, make us agents of hope. Hope in a world which cries out for new life. Eternal God, we pray that people everywhere will find strength and energy to shine your light wherever there is darkness, persecution, and despair. Give us all greater delight in your mystery and greater joy in seeking you. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hands to help, hearts to love. All this we ask through Christ Jesus, who made you known to us in a new way and revealed your way of love. Way of love. And now we pray together, singing the words that Jesus taught. embarking on a pretty big project here at Knox. 
To do so, it means we're going to need to do more than one thing at once. We're collecting and we're saving towards the renovation of our building. But at the same time, we're faithfully giving towards a fully funded ministry, that is um, what we call our day-to-day -day expenses, uh, of being the community's church in the heart of Old Oakville and developing empowered and loving disciples of Christ. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we received an anonymous gift from an adherent for $6,000 towards new roads, with the potential of committing more as the phases unfold. And just this week, we received yet another gift of stock from a Knox congregant with the proceeds amounting to almost 15000 Another gift to New Roads. You know who you are, and we say thank you. Thank you for your generosity, but even more, thank you for making so tangible your faith in God and in God's mission through the family of faith here at Knox Oakville. Your actions have a ripple effect that serves to inspire others. But it must also be said, friends, that collectively our congregation gave over $40,000 last month towards outreach, worship, faith formation, hospitality ministries here at Knox, and supporting the structures that support those ministries. Thank you, church, for your generosity. Thank you for sharing your faith there are congregations who can't boast that in a year, and we did it in January. You're invited now to continue in that vein, friends, giving to the Lord's work here through Knox Oakville as we seek to attain the goals set before us while trusting God to bless and multiply our giving. The offering will now be received in joy
heaven and earth, you call us to leave behind our preoccupations and to follow you into the future. Sometimes we find your call challenging. We are comfortable, maybe even complacent in our present. So may this act of giving be a sign that we hear your voice calling us forward. May this act of giving be a gesture of our willingness to follow where you lead. Take our tithes, Lord, our tithes and our offerings and our special gifts. Multiply them according to your will and your purposes and put them to work to bring about your kingdom of grace and justice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our closing hymn is on an insert in your bulletin. And it comes from this uh, other hymnal that we have, our worship team has fallen in love with, Lift Up Your Hearts. His eye is on the sparrow. And I think that'll be familiar to some, if not all of you. I invite you to sing this closing anthem, this closing phrase as a prayer and also an encouragement to you. His eye is on the sparrow. And his eye is on you too, watching you holding you up and helping you to live in the grace and freedom of his life in Christ. Let's sing together, His Eye is on the Sparrow.
brothers and sisters in Christ, not all is as it seems. There's a glory hidden in everything waiting to be revealed to the eyes of those who believe beyond what seems inevitable, waiting to be revealed to those who do not want to live in the status quo, but in the promises of God. Hold on to that vision as we turn now towards Lent and walk the difficult path. There is yet a greater glory still to be revealed. Go in peace, go in hope, go in love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.